it's such a massive category and you think about just the total addressable market of beauty you combine that with wellness today that's a trillion dollar market a and trillion dollar market wellness is yes hello everyone and welcome back to the technology of beauty where I have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business and today is no exception. We have Lindsay Carlson who came all the way from Atlanta, Georgia and she works with William Blair and it's so great to have you. Uh, you came from Buckhead today, right? I did. Thank you, Grant. It's great to be here. I know we first connected at Octane yep. when we were on that panel together and so I look forward to continuing the conversation today. Fantastic. It was a fun panel and that's a great meeting in Newport every year. Are you going to be there next year at Octane? I hope I so. I hope so too and I hope I am also. I think yes. I will. It's a fun meeting. And uh, we also have a meeting, AIS, which is a, uh, Aesthetic Innovation Summit. And that's the day before the Aesthetic Society meeting. And that will be in April in Miami. And I hope I can get you to come to that also. That I'll, would be fantastic. I'll try my best to get you there. <laughs> so let's see. Let's start with this. Where are you from? Where'd you grow up? I was born and raised in St. Louis. And I think there's a oh, St. Louis connection between wow. us, if I recall. Yes, there is. So you were born and raised in St. Louis. What hospital were you born in? That's a if good question. Know. I should know that. I do not know the answer to okay. that. Okay. Did you go to high school in St. Louis? I did. And that's what high school? The, that's the St. Louis question. I went to Mary Institute and St. Louis Country Day School, yes. also known as MICDS. Mm -hmm. I know it well. Well, fantastic. What part of town did you live in, out of curiosity? I lived in Kirkwood there. Uh huh. My parents are still there and have very fond memories of growing up there. Oh, that's wonderful. I was there for medical school at Washington University for, uh, for four years, and then I went back and did plastic surgery there and my fellowship there at uh, Washington University and Barnes Hospital. And sure. All the, I lived right there on uh, Kings Highway at the ABC building, the Central West End. The love second it. time. Love yeah, it. I love it. I actually it. got married on Washington University's campus. Oh, it's beautiful. So, full circle. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Okay. So off from St. Louis, where'd you go to college? So I stuck with my Midwestern roots and I went to Miami of Ohio mm -hmm. where I majored in accounting. Um, my father was a big supporter and, and a big push for me to do that. He wanted me to understand the building blocks of business. So I took his advice to heart. Um, and even further than that, once I graduated from Miami, I went on to the University of Michigan to get a master's in accounting. Uh -huh. And when I was there, it was a really pivotal time for me and, and formative year as I shifted my path from accounting into investment banking. And that's where my career has led for the past 15 plus years. So you've been a banker for 15 plus years. Boy, I have. You, and I don't I have. think you look like you could have been a banker that long. <laughs> okay, so... And have you been at William Blair the whole time? I have been at William Blair the whole time, which and is very unique. Yeah, Many bankers is. do not stay and build their careers at one firm. <laughs> and I think it's a big testament to the special place that William Blair is. Um, and your background with accounting sets you yes. apart from many bankers. And I think it's a wonderful background for the banking banker. So that's fantastic. And then, then when you, did you get your MBA then when you were at the University I didn't. of Michigan? So I, I got a master's in accounting there okay. and went straight into banking. Um, started in our Chicago office, spent a number of years there, which is where William Blair's headquarters are. Right. Then I moved to New York when we opened an office on the East Coast. And now Atlanta, as you mentioned, is home base for me. Uh -huh. I'd say the common thread through all of those different moves has been consumer. I've always been focused on advising exciting, high growth consumer brands and stories. And oh. that's a true passion of mine. Okay. Well, we're going to get into that because yes. we want to learn from you and about that. Okay, so you stayed at William Blair. You were always in consumer. What sort of brands early on were you working on that we would recognize, for instance? Oh, gosh, there's a lot of household and iconic brands like a Lululemon, a Duluth Trading, Annie's on the food and beverage side, Planet Fitness. You think about just gyms and um, fitness chains. So it, it really runs the gamut. Okay. And when did you get into aesthetics? So I got into beauty a handful oh, beauty. of years ago. We had covered the category under consumer products um, at Blair for a number of years, and we saw just the continued amount of M&A activity um, was very steady and actually continued to rise. And so I was tapped to lead our beauty 
and wellness efforts, um, which has been great. There's so across the entire William Blair? Yes. yes. So what's your title, your proper title? So I am a partner in our consumer and retail group and a managing director and head of beauty and wellness. Okay. So can you share with us the brand you're working on now or is that confidential information? That's confidential now, but I think um, our listeners today would probably be interested in some of the more aesthetic oriented deals that we've done as of late. Exactly. Um, we advised Elastin Skincare okay. on their sale to Galderma, mm -hmm. which was a very exciting deal, which closed earlier this year. That's um, right. We were the sell site advisor to Elastin. Um, another one in that professional skincare space, we advised Griffin Investors. Uh -huh. They're a private equity firm here on the West Coast. They acquired Revision Skincare mm -hmm. and Goodier, mm -hmm. another great deal. Um, we advised Beauty Health on their recent convertible debt offering that they raised to put a lot of capital on their balance sheet. They've been very public about their intentions to do M&A deals in this space. And how much money did you put on their balance sheet? It was a $500 million deal. Okay, excellent. And they continue to perform very well. Right. And then most recently, we advised a business called Elevation Labs. So as you think about beauty, it's very much brand oriented, they're service providers. And this is a value added development partner that manufactures for very exciting brands in the space. And some of their key clients are professional skincare brands, mm -hmm. um, prestige skincare and, and hair care brands. And we sold that business to Knox Lane, which is a, another private equity firm here on the West Coast. Wow. Well, first I wanna thank you for advising on the Elastin deal. Uh, that was uh, a deal I was involved in, and I am so happy uh, <laughs> with the, what you were able to pull off with Galderma. Thank you very much. Yes, hopefully we got we'll to hit a fantastic the, outcome. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, we've had a number of people from Alaskan on the show, actually, including yes. Marianne Guerra, as you know, and Diane. And, and, yeah, I mean, excuse me, not Marianne, Diane, too. Diane yes. Goostry, that's yes. what I meant. Excuse me. And. Uh, We've had other people also, as you know, from the from the the line, and I and from Galderma, we had uh, uh, different Galderma people. That's great. So, That's great. That was Fleming. such an exciting story, and I think, um, you know, just their ability to ramp that business from 2015 to exiting it earlier, or essentially Amazing. late 2021, their hyper growth mode. Right, they had over a hundred percent top line Kager, yeah. which is just off the charts. I mean, they were the fastest growing professional skincare brand at that time. Uh -huh. um, you think about the innovation that they led, right? You know this very yes. well. They created a whole new category right. for that space. And that partnership is just perfect. You look at Galderma's um, portfolio, leading with injectables like Restylane and Dysport, mm -hmm. and then their consumer brands, um, Cetaphil being just a powerhouse, but there was a big white space opportunity for them. Right, you have the consumer who's going into the derm, who's going in to see her plastic surgeon, and perhaps getting injectables and recommended an Elastin skincare um, product. It it makes complete sense for them to own that. No question. And so really, just a win-win in their ability to supercharge it with their global presence and and take the brand into the hands of more and more consumers. I couldn't agree with you more. So thank you very much for your ha hand in that for <laughs> sure. Yes. And. How do you see the aesthetic business developing now? Uh, what, what do you see in the future? What's going it's, on? It's such a massive category. And you think about just the total addressable market of beauty. It's half a billion. You combine that with wellness today, that's a trillion dollar market. A and trillion dollar market? Wellness is, yes. And I think what's just so interesting about beauty and aesthetics is that the definition continues to evolve, right? And you think about the consumer today, that inner health is such a big part of your outer appearance and beauty. And that convergence between beauty, aesthetics, healthcare, technology, of course, right, just really expands the market. And in my world, we used to think of beauty as skincare, color cosmetics, hair care. Now that definition is much broader. It includes things like vitamins and supplements, right? right. Sexual wellness, aesthetics, right? Everything that's happening in, in med spas, all of the services. 
you know, punchline is it's it's a massive market and it's growing. And that's what I think is so exciting. So along those lines, we've had the opportunity to interview different people, obviously, on this yes. show. And recently we were able to interview Nikki uh, regarding uh, the sweat market, basically, right? The sure. h- hyperhidrosis in general for the FDA uh, clearance and so forth. But the whole idea of limiting sweat, which and that might help in terms of ruining your clothing, personal confidence, and so forth. Any comments along those lines that you can share with us regarding that market? I'm just cu- that, curious that what your thoughts are. new. I think it's very innovative, and I think the consumer's open to trying new things, right? Uh-huh. And you think about just on the consumable front, they are expanding their horizons. They're trying new products that have endorsement from a trusted professional, And if you're in a derm, a plastics office, and you explain an issue that you have, and you hear about a new solution, right? I think the consumer is very open to that. You talk about confidence, you know, that plays into it too. The the consumer's taking this into primarily her own hands, but men are a big part of the story today too. Mm -hmm. You think about self-care, right? It's, It's really being proactive and in your health Mm -hmm. and getting the solutions that you need to feel beautiful and to have the confidence what do you think about the average age going down i think it's going down dramatically and i think that that's a very powerful trend for (laughs) um, companies in the space because you're able to really connect with that consumer at an early age and stay with them for a longer period of time Mm -hmm. right it's a big benefit for everyone for the whole for the whole industry, For the right? whole industry, for sure, right. for sure. And you're seeing consumers are doing aesthetic treatments much earlier. And that goes hand in hand with the growth we're seeing on the product side. Because once you're using those services and getting injectables or Botox or cool sculpting or whatever it may be, right, with it mm-hmm. going back to Elastin, you're using those skincare products, you're exposed to that, you're familiar with that you're on that path right. because you're going to maintain and, and prevent for a longer period of time. So it's kind of like the drug dealer model. We get them hooked on Elastin <laughs> and then we just keep on going. Exactly, um, exactly. So in the subject of toxins or neuromodulators, neurotoxins, I hate the word toxin, but you know what I'm talking about, the classic, of course, being Botox. But we have five of them now. Uh, we're looking at another one and now and maybe another one. So, But... The question I have for you, and when you advise companies and other people, and I'd love to know what your thoughts are about duration, because presently the five we have are more similar than they're different. Of course, there are some uh, uh, there's some differences in the five, but for the most part, they're they last three to four months. They do pretty much the same thing. I know everyone can argue this, but but uh, but now we have one potentially that may be approved shortly, maybe uh, that is to say cleared. That, that allegedly has a twice as long uh, indication. And um, and then we hear about yet another one on the program. Fleming talked about Galderma actually sure. having now one that may follow with, again, a six-month or longer indication. What are your thoughts about the longer indications, just in general, without even being product-specific? You could be product agnostic, but longer duration versus the existing duration. Do you think that's going to change behavior? A consumer behavior, and if so, which direction? I think that's a plus for the consumer, right? You okay. get the extended benefit um, for a longer period of time. I think the question, going back to a business perspective of that, is you have the consumer in your office, in your chair, less often. Mm-hmm. And what is the financial impact of that? And you have to balance it, right? I to think. the physician. For sure, okay. yes, yes. Okay. It's a balance. I think this consumer who plays in this world is not just doing one type of treatment and it's getting them familiar with other offerings in your office, right? What else can they be doing to address other needs that they might have? Mm-hmm. Getting them on a skincare product regime to the extent that they're not on that front. I think there's other opportunities to speak um, to the patient, to the consumer. But ultimately, you know, if that's a bigger, if that's a big benefit, which it seems like it would be to have that extend longer. I think that's a win-win for everyone. Okay. There was a toxin, it still exists, that I think Allergan actually bought it, that it kicked in sooner, but it lasted much shorter. And I, I don't remember the name of it. I think it was at a Newport Beach. 
Uh, and I always wondered, why would someone want a shorter acting toxin? And then I was given an argument for that, but I, I never could understand why someone would want something to last shorter. But uh, and that's Sounds like more maintenance and more time in the chair. It's not commercialized, <laughs> so I'm not sure what's going to happen with that. Yes. But I tend to agree with you. And certainly in the therapeutic side, not in the cosmetic side, but in the therapeutic side, if you're uh, benefiting from a neurotoxin uh, therapeutically for some r medical reason, yes. the fact that it lasts... Uh, six months, say, hypothetically, we'll say sure. six months, and you can get it twice a year. It seems like a huge advantage to me if I'm yes. getting treated for whatever, migraines, uh, sweating, whatever the Absolutely. issue. Uh, that seems certainly uh, a better deal. Plus, I think Medicare and the third-party carriers would rather pay physicians twice instead of four times. <laughs> If you True. know what I mean. True. <laughs> and sometimes that directs the market, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So what other areas within the aesthetic space are really uh, interesting you? I mean, are there other areas that you've seen either up and coming or developing? I think what's interesting to watch going back to just the categories within beauty and aesthetics, you know, skincare has gotten a lot of buzz. Yes. Everyone has talked about the shift to that professional recommendation. You think about traditional beauty, which has been very influencer driven, having that authority um, speak to a product and products that have a lot of proprietary technology, clinical studies behind them. There's proven efficacy that's very powerful in mm -hmm. my world there's been a lot of buzz about products have to be clean and mm. clean is now table stakes but i think the consumer wants more than clean products and clean this is from an ingredient standpoint what do you mean by that they want products that work that don't have unnecessary ingredients that could be perceived as bad for you as you think about clean household products okay. right eating clean you want clean products that go on your face um but really cutting through that, and that's still a theme, cutting through that, it's products that work, right? Products that truly work. And you've seen that in skincare, it's played out very well. I think we're starting to see that in hair care now. And that's a, a big, massive market as well. It's talked about as the skinification of hair. Mm. And you know, you think coming out of a pandemic, People have been stressed. People have been pent up at home. There's been a lot of issues that people have noticed in and around their hair. Things like hair loss, hair thinning. How is products, how are different you know, ingestibles treating that need? Uh -huh. um, that's, that's been, a, there's been a lot of interest in, in that as of late. Well, I've certainly seen a lot about supplements and topicals yes. for, for thicker hair and sure. hair growth. Um, which actually leads me to the question I wanted to ask you. What about exosomes? I keep hearing about exosomes. Is, are you being uh, uh, assaulted by this exosome craze? Not yet, but I'm going to have to get up to speed. Oh, well, More on the beauty side, that's not as Well, big we thing. keep hearing about exosomes yeah. in, on, in topicals for, for, for transcutaneous application. Uh, to stimulate and inter modulate and turn on cells and so forth. So okay. I was curious if you've been exposed to that much. Certainly uh, the supplements for hair, both topical and oral, a lot of, lot of buzz in our offices and in the aesthetic industry. Yes, for uh, sure. No for question sure. about that. And it's caught the attention of strategics too. You think about building a business and building a brand for an exit. A lot of founders have strategic goals right and, and aspirations of how to do that and mm -hmm. you know that's a, a unique category they're doing something different there's a real point of differentiation mm -hmm. which catches like i said the attention of some of the larger players um well speaking of that hydrofacial and i yes. know you're involved in that company uh brent is taking that international right. using influencers and also leaving the doctor office and going all I mean not not abandoning the doctor office but it seems expanding into the whole spa world not it just is. med spa would it you is. agree yes and, absolutely absolutely um, it's becoming a household name yes right? it is. everyone knows what a hydrofacial is yes more or less. Yeah, I agree and I've watched that with Clint at the helm and then with Brent purchasing it and so forth and and moving on and now it, we have Andrew and running I, I, it and Andrew Cody. was on the show yes. and, and Andrew yeah. and in his background Sure. It's very aligned with the things you're doing, right? Yes, yes. Um, 
and it'd be interesting to see what their next acquisition is. Any thoughts on that that you can share? <laughs> Probably not. But I know they've been looking at a lot, and we've had a lot of conversations, and we've shared ideas with them. You know, I think there's a lot of directions they can take it because, uh-huh. again, it goes back to that very strong relationship between that esthetician or whoever's giving that treatment and the client, who mm-hmm. the patient who is um, in the chair, right? Their ears are open. They're listening to what products they can recommend. I think a product makes a lot of sense, um, but there's a lot of different ways they could they could go with that. I would agree. I think it's going to be really exciting to watch them as they go forward. Yes. Now, uh, you advised on the Elastin side, advised Elastin on the Galderma thing, uh, deal. What do you think Galderma's position is in aesthetics? And, they, and I know you were advising Elastin, right. but right. What, do you, what do you see in the future with Galderma? Do you have any comments well, on that? Know, they're, they're the world's largest um, derm company Mm -hmm. and that gives them a lot of power there's been a lot of chatter about a potential ipo unfortunately the the markets aren't conducive for that and and cooperate on that front but they will open up again and there will be an opportunity for them to do so but you know elastin was a a great big deal for them and and filled a white space opportunity I think as they look at their existing portfolio, there are a few other white spaces for them. You know, I mentioned hair care. I think that's an area that they could go as well. Um, And I think that they're just evaluating other, um, you know, opportunities. They could do another skincare brand on the consumer side where they have Mm. more of a presence in a food drug mass channel. And they're unique in that they have both their, their professional side and their consumer side. Right. And so they could look to supplement either of those channels. And the consumer today, she's bouncing back and forth between both. Right. She's in that professional channel. She's also shopping at Ulta, Sephora Uh and at Whole Foods or Target and Walmart. And where is she getting her information? This female consumer. Yes. Where is she getting most of her information nowadays? I think she's getting it from everywhere. And, you know, with beauty, there's a big element of discovery, right? And finding brands that really excite and delight her. And so she's perusing, you know, the beauty retailers, Sephora, Ulta. She's listening online. I think a lot of these, um, I say women again, but men too, right? right? They're very engaged with brands. And that's a big theme that we're seeing is brands that are winning today, they have a community. They have a community of users that are very loyal, that are plugging into social channels, whether it's Instagram of the past or TikTok or Be Real, whatever it is. Um, you know, they want to engage. They want to have a conversation. They're sharing how they're using products today. Right. And, you know, it's a win-win for the brands too because they can pick up and they can do social listening and see um, – you know, what really excites their consumers. Some companies are using influencers and uh, yes. stars and so for forth. For sure, for sure. What effect is that having on the buying uh, habits of these these consumers? What's I think it has. A, I think it has a big impact, right? People okay. want to learn about new products. And if they have a trusted influencer that they follow and really like and feel a connection to, I think they're more open and willing to try the products that they share and that they put in front of them. You know, you see celebrities. There's a lot of celebrities that have started their own beauty brands. Yes. And they clearly have a big reach, too. Um, So, you know, that that whole side of of marketing, of um, brand awareness, brand building is very powerful and continues to be. And I think what's interesting, you know, for our listeners today is that, You've seen doctors and plastic surgeons take that angle Mm -hmm. as well, right? There's a lot of um, players that are on TikTok and Instagram and have great followings, and they're reaching a new consumer base by Mm -hmm. doing so Mm -hmm. and finding new patients and and potential long-term clients. No question. Now, what about different ways of paying for it specifically what are your thoughts about subscription services and subscription as it relates to access to the beauty products or beauty services yes it's a powerful model 
right? And it's it's powerful because you retain more often than not um, that consumer for a longer period of time, but it's really the data behind it. And you're able to dig into the stats and see how long is that customer with us? How much is he or she buying? What's the average order size? How frequently are they coming back? How much time are they spending on our website, right? Um, are they adding new products to their subscription let's say they're they've got you know skincare a cleanser that they get uh-huh. every month or every three months are they going back and adding a moisturizer or an eye cream a neck cream um it's it's really powerful for the brand standpoint to be able to dig into that that data so you think we'll, we're going to be seeing more subscription based services from different companies i i think so yes yeah it seems like yeah, the younger all, all consumer industries are, especially. are tapping into that okay the convenience aspect. Are of websites thing. dead? Websites aren't dead, but Omnichannel is back in a big way. D to C, everyone was making a big push. You have to be online. Digitally native companies, there was a lot of buzz a few years back. They were very, very powerful. Um, and they were, especially during COVID when everyone was on lockdown and that was your way to, to shop and buy and purchase for yourself and for your family. But coming out of that, we have seen the importance of retail in a really dramatic way. You have to be everywhere the consumer is today, right? And they want to be online. They want to be on their phones and on websites. But they also want to walk um, the aisles in a store. And they want to peruse the shelves and discover new brands that way. So for, it's both. For our listeners, can you describe Omnichannel and D to C? Yes. For some that don't know D what you're talking C about. D2C is direct to consumer, mm-hmm. so a website. And Omnichannel is both a brick and mortar ex- uh, exposure and presence, as well as having an online presence. And that could be through your own .com, your own website, or through Amazon, mm-hmm. which has made a big push into beauty. Now, some have predicted that we're about to enter a, a, another recession or extend the one we're in or whatever, depending on what your own philosophy is. You're a banker, you're a financial yes. person, you're an accountant by training, and yet you're in the beauty business. You did allude earlier to the fact that this, seems, this business, this segment, seems to be um, not as affected. There's the old lipstick story and yes. the dis- depression, and we're all familiar with that. Sure. What... What's going to happen here, you know, in terms of, let's say we go into a, a greater recession. You mentioned the markets are down right now. Uh, what if this extends out? Do we, yeah, <laughs> we have good days and bad days. But, okay, long term, within the beauty business, the uh, confidence business, if you will, yes. what effects will the recession, if we have one, uh, have on that if you were advising uh, businesses startups whatever I'd love to hear yeah. your thoughts on that it's a great question and one that we are asked regularly um, I think punchline is the news is been very negative as of late and I think unrightfully so right we've been dealing with new issues we came out of a pandemic we've right. gone into geopolitical um, noise economic turmoil and the consumer has been a little nervous, right? We've seen inflation, we've seen interest rates rise, gas prices have been through the roof. It's starting to moderate a little bit. And I think if you do a double click into the consumer, how is the consumer thinking about things? Consumer sentiment has been up. The consumer has never been stronger. You look at just their amount of wealth. Home prices are up. They have accessibility to debt. Um, unemployment is very low. So mm-hmm. the consumer overall is in a good spot right now. Okay. You know, should a recession hit, I think the beauty industry is relatively insulated compared to other industries. Um, we're talking about products. We're talking about services. This is a consumer who will trade down in certain areas potentially, who will prolong treatments, right? If you're talking about aesthetic services, Mm -hmm. they're not going to stop. They're just going to move dollars from one basket to another, right? Your beloved skincare regime, whatever you're using on your hair, you're not going to change that. That's going to be one of the last things that you're going to change. And beauty, if you look back through the cycles, has been very recession resistant. And that's what investors love about it. That's why strategics get behind this category in such a big way. It's why they pay big multiples for these brands because they know there's a stickiness. They know that there's a loyalty 
and they're somewhat insulated. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's always going to be concerns that they're faced with, like supply chain, like, you know, potential cost increase they're going to need to take. But generally speaking, this is one thing that I just love about this industry. It's protected from that front. And for the most part, it's cash based too. So yes, exactly. That's another pro, exactly. right? Cash is king. Yeah. So there you go. Well, that's encouraging for all of us in the beauty business. Yes. Now, I noticed you brought your crystal ball there in your bag. So as you look into it, we've talked about a lot of things in the future, and I appreciate that. I and mean, your insights are fantastic. I don't want to thank you for them. But what are we going to see, say, three years from now, five years from now? What do you see in. And if we're on this show three years from now, what what does the beauty world look like in five years from now? What, yes. are, what do you think we're going to be seeing? Well, I wish I had a crystal ball. You have it. I saw I think, you come in with it. I think this industry is going to continue to grow. It is going to continue to evolve. It is a really exciting space right now. There's a lot of buzz about these different categories and the convergence, right? I think we're going to see more and more convergence between beauty, health, technology. Those are really big themes. And innovation is just through the charts. What companies are doing on the research and development front to bring newness to this category mm -hmm. is very exciting. I think we're going to see more and more um, investors come into this space and strategic buyers. Um, you have seen folks look at the category from afar, see the growth that it brings, um, the stickiness, that loyalty we talked about, and mm -hmm. they want to get in on the action. And I think you're going to see, you know, continued newness from a brand standpoint, too. There's a lot of beauty brands that are popping up um, overnight, it mm -hmm. seems. And those that have staying power are really poised for success. And people want to get behind them. And they, they want to partner with them. So well, I think it's going to be exciting. So you're very bullish. Yes, very optimistic. Uh, so <clears throat> the category is growing. I'm curious, do you think the percentage of the population who is getting the the consuming the product we'll say whatever that looks like do you think that percentage is growing and will continue to grow over time absolutely you do. especially as you think about you know it's traditionally been a female driven industry mm -hmm. men are coming into this in a dramatic way you're seeing a lot of men's brands pop up from a skincare standpoint for example um, that just adds more people into this and again we talked about a consumer coming in at a younger age sure so that's a plus as well well thank you very much it's been a pleasure having you on the show and i want to thank you for coming in and sharing your thoughts i hope you're right i think you're right also in the next three to five years i think we're going to see a higher percentage higher absolute numbers more men and lower average age of the consumer yes so, let's hope. and more m a activity More so MA, you'll be sure. doing those deals yes. and uh, we'll have a safe trip back to atlanta and again thank you very much for sharing thank your you. valuable time with us and i'd like to thank all of you for joining us today on another episode of the technology of beauty where i have the opportunity to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business and as you heard today and saw today today was no exception we'll see you next tuesday